what a truly, truly wonderful morning that it is to come into the Lord's house and freely worship Him. It's, it's such a blessing. I'm so thankful that each of you come faithfully every Sunday and see the need to worship and serve our risen Savior, who is Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're going to continue to worship and praise Him this morning through the preaching of the Word. And over the last couple of months, we've been periodically looking at the seven churches in Revelation, specifically in Revelation chapter 2 through 3. We've looked at six of those seven churches, and uh, my intent through the Lord's divine leading has been to expose the letters that were written to these churches by Jesus Christ Himself in order that we could better understand what Christ would have for our church today. Learn from their mistakes. Learn from uh, the positive things that Jesus commended them for. And so there were good and bad in each church. Some had all good, uh, as we looked at last week. But I just want to recap those just briefly as uh, we've looked at those and then come to our final church this morning. The first church was uh, the church in Ephesus. And they were good at discerning between false and true uh, apostles and prophets but they had lost the love that they had first for Christ. They had lost their love for Christ. And then we looked at the church in Smyrna, which was called the persecuted church. They didn't have anything uh, that Christ had against them other than he was encouraging them to continue through uh, the persecution. And we looked at that as to how persecution still comes to us uh, through the same means, which is Satan. And so that was the second church. The third church was the church in Pergamum called the Compromising Church. And they were called that because their beliefs and uh, the society that was around them had infiltrated the church. And thus they had compromised their beliefs with the ways of the world. And so Christ had that against them. The fourth church was the church in Thyatira, who was described as the corrupt church because they not only compromised with the ways of the world, but they tolerated sin. And so in tolerating sin, that sin not only was a part of their society, but it actually became a part of their doctrinal beliefs within that church. And so Christ gave them the opportunity to repent. Then we looked at the church in Sardis, the fifth church, who was called the dead church because there was only a few left in that church who were working faithfully for the Lord. And we talked about how there are many churches today considered a dead church because they just aren't that many faithful workers for the kingdom of God present within that church any longer. And then last week, the sixth church we undertook last week was a very uplifting one, the church in Philadelphia, found in Revelation chapter 3. And the church in Philadelphia was a very faithful church. It was considered the faithful church, and it was, it was very encouraging for us to look at because it was considered a church of little power. But that didn't mean it didn't have great power from God. It was that they were a small in numbers church. And so that small church was very faithful. They uh, were faithful in their works. They had kept the word of Christ. Uh, they accepted the name of Christ. And because of such, if you remember, they had been given an open door to the kingdom of God, and thus those that came into the open doors of the church in Philadelphia also would know how to experience an open door uh, when their appointed time comes to go to the kingdom of God. And so truthfully, as we looked at that church last week, I spoiled you. I spoiled you with that message because this morning is a much harder message to look at this last church. The church in Philadelphia is a very uplifting church, a church that we strive to be like. Uh, so that we are considered faithful in the eyes of Christ. But then we come to the church in Philadelphia, and we see that they were not as faithful. It's called the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And that's what we're going to be looking at, looking at how this church was not obedient, this church was not favored in the eyes of Christ, and we look at it to make ourselves aware of not becoming a church like this. And, and as we look at these, I really encourage you to open up your scriptures and follow along with me because these names like Smyrna and Thyatira and Laodicea, you know, they're, they're not as common as Halifax, Sparksville, Virgilina, and South Boston. But they are very easy to understand when you're looking at the passages and, and put ourselves in their shoes and what would Christ be saying to us uh, today? What is he saying? to us today. So that's the passage we're looking at. Before we look into it, let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for Your Word. Lord, may You just speak through me, Father, and, and be uh, that willing vessel You've called me to be to preach Your Word. May it be delivered understandably. And Lord, may You just uh, work within the hearts of those that receive it this morning. And may it not go in vain, Lord, but be received and be applied to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here we come to this seventh and final church, as Jesus has written these letters to uh, these churches. And this is considered the most unfaithful, the most unrighteous, the most unworthy church to be fit for the kingdom of God. It is the worst church that Jesus writes a letter to. In the New King James, it is considered the, and you've heard this statement many times, it's considered the lukewarm church. It's considered neither hot nor cold. And we're going to talk about that and see what does it mean to be considered a lukewarm church. It may not be what you have previously understood to be a lukewarm church or a lukewarm Christian. But going back to verse 14, Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea. We know that the angel of the church is the pastor or the leader of that church that would be receiving this letter and then delivering it uh, to this given church that is a real church that was in a real place that is made up of real people. And it tells us, uh, Jesus explains himself here. He says, he calls himself the words of the Amen. The Amen is what he first calls himself. And so... Uh, we see that, but I, I need to give you a little background of Laodicea for us to understand the situation and the explanation that Jesus gives this church in order to help them uh, turn from their wicked ways. So Laodicea was the wealthiest place in this region. As opposed to the other six regions, this was the most wealthiest area you could live in. And it had three prominent industries. One was wool. It was known for uh, its black wool and being able to distribute uh, fine wool. It was also known for its banking. It was known for being very wealthy with money and uh, having that very large banking industry. And it was also known for its medicine, particularly with eye salve. That's uh, medicine you would place on your eyes to uh, promote healing uh, during this time. So that was the three prominent industries that it had but it also had a very big problem for the whole city. This city had a very inadequate water supply. They didn't have good drinking water. And what I mean bad, they were as bad as this side of Aaron's Creek Road trying to get good water. So it was a bad situation to be in. So they had built, and it was a great feat that they did, but they had for the city an underground water uh, aqueduct to store the water to be able to provide uh, some form of water to the city. But it wasn't still a good water supply. It was only enough to supply the city with, but it was still considered inadequate, not cleansing, not uh, in any way good water uh, for this city. It was enough to get by, uh, kind of like what we have on the other side of the road. You could wash your car with it, you could water your garden with it, but you couldn't drink it or cook with it. So uh, that's about what they had. And so in this verse, as I said, Jesus has described himself in three ways. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, 
and the beginning of God's creation. So first of all, he calls himself the Amen. And that's a very fitting title that is never really used for Jesus, uh, other than when he uses it for himself, but it is a very fitting one. So what does Amen mean? Many of you say Amen uh, at the end of your prayers, and then a lot of you say it during a sermon or during uh, a message that is given. You say Amen because... Uh, you feel led to say it. Well, what does amen mean? It means what has been previously said is faithful and true. What has been previously stated, whatever it may be, whether it's in a message or what you have said in a prayer, is faithful and true, and you are agreeing with what has just been said. So when you say it during, uh, when a sermon is delivered, you are saying that what has just been said by the preacher is a faithful and true statement. When you say it at the end of a prayer, we're saying it because we know that what we have said to God through our request and through our praises unto Him, we know that He is faithful to answer those prayers and receive those prayers, but also what we have said to God is faithful and true as well. And so we can see that relationship between the faith of God for His people and us uh, unto God. And so... That's what Amen means. So as Jesus uses it as a title here, it's very fitting because knowing who Jesus is, what He has done, and the work that He still accomplishes today, we know that He is the definition of faithful and truthfulness. And so for Him to call Himself the words of the Amen, Jesus is truly the one who is the perfect example of who is faithful and true. And everything that He says and everything that has been previously stated about him in the scriptures is faithful and true. So he is called the Amen. The second thing is just a expounding upon that when he says the words of the Amen and also he considers himself the faithful and true witness is who he calls himself. And so knowing that the Amen means what has been said is faithful and true, he is the faithful and true witness, and we know that most importantly, he's the faithful and true witness of God himself. We know that from John 14, 6. We know that Jesus claims, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not only does Jesus explicitly say he is the truth, but he is also the way unto the Father, so he is that faithful witness to the Father and of the Father as well. And uh, John MacArthur said he is the perfectly accurate witness to the truth of God. I love how these statements John MacArthur makes can make it so clear. But he is the perfectly accurate witness to the truth of God. That is Jesus Christ. And then the final uh, explanation he gives, the, the title he gives as he goes into this letter, is the beginning of God's creation. Now, Jesus is considered the beginning of of God's creation. It is not that Jesus was created. This was a heresy going on during the uh, area of Colossae and during uh, the area of Laodicea as well. So that's why Jesus explains himself in this way. He was not created by God. He was not, when he came in the form of a child uh, to the Virgin Mary, he was not created then, but rather he was sent then by God to come in that way. And so, I had a uh, teacher come in, he was brand new, he was also our assistant principal, in the seventh grade uh, in our Bible class. And he came in and the first statement he made wasn't hello, hi, or this is my name. The first day of Bible class that year, he said, Jesus created the world. And we sat there and said, where did they find this guy? What does he mean Jesus created the world? We know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we find very clearly that Jesus did create the world with God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, being Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then you can look at John chapter 3, verse 13. It says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And we know that to be Jesus Christ. So he has always been. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the essence of God in uh, man form, in, in the fleshly form. 
And so we understand that He is the beginning of all creation, as Scripture has taught us and as He has told us here in Revelation 3.14. So we know Jesus is writing the letter. He has called Himself the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. And then verse 15, He starts to expose uh, this church, this, this uh, church in Laodicea. And Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So every church that he writes to, he says that statement. I know your works. He even said it to the church in Philadelphia when all he had to say was commendable things that that church was doing. So when he says here, I know your works, we're going to see that this church had evil works. They had unfaithful works. They had works that did not prosper the kingdom of God in their given situation. He knows their works and he is not appreciative of the work that they are putting in. And he calls them neither cold nor hot. And then the ESV has a, a kind of a different way of putting it. But he says, would that you were either cold or hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So what does that mean? What does it mean, I wish that you were either cold or hot? Well, a Christian that is cold is one that has not accepted Jesus Christ, but rather has rejected Jesus Christ. It is the non-Christians. It is the atheists. It is those that have denied the name of Christ. And they don't fit into that category. The hot is the ones that are on fire for Christ. And we know what that means. They have accepted Jesus Christ. They have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. They're going and they're active within their church and within their community to go out and spread the gospel. And Jesus says, you're neither one of these. I wish that you were one or the other so that I could define what you are so that I would have something to fix. But what you are right now is really hard to fix because you're neither one of those. Rather, what this church was doing and the reason why they're considered lukewarm is because they were claiming to be Christians and claiming to know Christ, but they had never accepted Christ as their personal Savior. They thought that they knew Christ, but Christ never knew them as His fellow believers. And so these are considered lukewarm Christians, and Jesus goes on to explain that in verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my, my mouth. And your version may say, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The way this church was living and the way this church was going about its ministry and the way that this church was carrying itself made Jesus sick. So much so that he would rather vomit them out of his mouth than call them a church to call them a people that was serving him because they weren't they weren't serving Christ they did not believe in him they claimed to know him but they never knew him as their personal savior so in doing so and living that life and believing in that way he would rather spit them out of his mouth vomit them out of his mouth they made him sick to call themselves a church Verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So this verse is the reason why I gave you the background of what this place is and, and what they are known for. This is the wealthiest city that is in this area. They think that they have it all. They can't need anything else. And if you ever find somebody that thinks they have it all, they are very, very lost because they do not have it all. We have not received it all until our appointed time comes and Jesus Christ comes. But this church and, and the people within it and the area that it is placed in considered themselves rich. They considered themselves prosperous. They said that I need nothing. And Jesus knew that they felt that way. However, they did not realize that they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. This is how Jesus describes this church. And so they thought they had it all. They had the banking industry. They had the wool industry. They had great medicine specifically for the eyes. And so they had all that they could ever temporarily need. But they had nothing as far as eternity was concerned except for eternity of damnation. 
And so I gave you the backstory, and, and a part of that was the aqueduct. Remember, it has they have lukewarm water, and so when he calls them lukewarm, they can relate to that because they are receiving lukewarm water day after day. And I can tell you, there is nothing in this world that you would want to eat or to put into your body that is lukewarm. I've never had anything that I wish this was room temperature. It would taste so much better. <laughs> I've never had anything that is lukewarm. Most anything that you eat that is room temperature or drink, you want to spit back up. You want to vomit back up. And that's the water that they were receiving day after day. And so when Jesus explains to the people that they are a lukewarm people, they know exactly what he means because when he says, I want to spit you up, it's because you are nothing to me. You are not cool and refreshing. You're not um, cleansing as far as hot water is concerned. And uh, if any of you take a shower with lukewarm water, you know that your day is just, you'd rather just go about another day because uh, that is not a good day. My wife complains about that very much so because I try to jump in the shower first and I use every bit of it. So the lukewarm water is is what she gets, and I apologize for that. <laughs> it's only been a year. So. <laughs> but lukewarm water, this was not something. This, this was a stagnant water. This was a nasty water. This was a dirty water. And so, um, just looking for my notes here, the, uh, there were two close by places that had really good water, too. It was the sad thing. It, it was as if Virgilana had very pure cold water, and it's as if Clarksville had very uh, hot uh, cleansing water uh, in this area. And so the two places nearby was Heropolis, and they were known for their hot springs. They were known for having these hot springs to get in and be cleansed and, and be uh, washed away from impurities. And so they were known for their hot springs. And then Colossae, which is the same place where the uh, letter to the Colossians was written unto, they were known for their cold mountain stream that ran through the city. And we know that cold mountain streams, how refreshing that can be to drink and to get in, and uh, so on and so forth. And so Jesus knows this church to be lukewarm. You are neither cold nor are you hot. And so we come into verse 18 here, after Jesus has explained that they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Interesting enough, they're, they're poor. They're considering themselves a rich nation, a rich city, but Jesus calls them poor. He calls them blind, although they're known for making this uh, very uh, powerful, uh, very uh, well-working eye salve to put on your eyes to be able to see better. Jesus calls them blind, and then... He calls them naked, and the other industry that they're known for is making wool, making clothes, being able to uh, furnish those things so that they are not naked. And Jesus exposes all three things that they thought they were good for, but Jesus is talking about eternity. And they've got nothing going for them considering eternity in the kingdom of God. And so verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Jesus offers them what they thought they already had, gold, wool, white garments, and this eye salve, so that they may see. This as Jesus offers it, is for spiritual, eternal reward, not temporary gain in which Laodicea had. The gold that Jesus offers is considered being richly blessed for all of eternity. The white garments are that that they may clothe themselves in their nakedness, and we know that white garments always refer to uh, a purity or being pure, being made pure by Jesus Christ. And then the eye salve is the spiritual salve so that they may no longer be blinded by the world and worldly things and evil as a whole, but rather that they may see the light of Jesus Christ and no longer be blinded 
by the ways of the world. So what Jesus offers them here when he says, I counsel you to buy from me, this is at no cost other than giving up what you have, giving up the thoughts that you have, giving up the beliefs that you have. I counsel you, I'm giving you a second chance. I'm giving you another opportunity to turn from your ways before I destroy you. And so he's given them that second chance. And then in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I love you. I love you as a people. I love you that you were created by my Father God through me. However, because I love you, I've got to discipline you because the way you are carrying your church is not the way in which I intended. And so I have given you the opportunity to be zealous and repent. Repent from your ways. Buy from me the gold, the white garments, the I salve that I provide, which all of that encompassed is salvation. He is offering them eternal salvation, true salvation from their sins into the kingdom of God. I'm giving you that opportunity, and this may be your last one. And so repent from your ways. Jesus says this in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. What a, what a beautiful verse to transition from the church in Philadelphia to the church in Laodicea because we know that the church in Philadelphia had been given an open door to the kingdom of God because of their faithful ways. Well, Jesus says, and he's talking about the church here, the church in Laodicea, I stand at your door and knock. I want to be in your church. I want to be the head of your church. I want to be the leader of your church. I want to be the head over the body that you call yourselves to be. But you have shut your doors on me. You have not allowed the one who has founded and perfected the church. You have not let me in. There was not one believer in the church in Laodicea, including the one who was receiving this letter, the leader of that church, the pastor himself. There was not one believer in this church. It's a sad situation that Laodicea is in. If you look at, and the reason why I say there's no believers in this church, in the other churches, although they had problems, Jesus still says that there are some who are faithful, some that still believe in me. Uh, Revelation 2, 24, talking about the church in Thyatira. Jesus said, but the, to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, do not lay on any other uh, a burden. So there are some in Thyatira that have still been faithful, that have not fallen into the ways of Satan. And then uh, chapter 3, Revelation 3, verse 2, talking about the church in Sardis. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of of my God. There are a few who still have faithful works in that dead church. And he calls them and says, you have got to wake up. You've got to wake the others up. You have got to become more active before you all die. And the whole church is considered a dead church. Jesus didn't have that for Laodicea. He didn't have anybody in that church that had true, genuine salvation in him. Rather, he had been shut out. He had been shut out, so he had to stand at the door and knock to see if there was one person that would allow him to come into the church and make it a church that he intended for it to be. Verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. We know that John is recording this revelation and this letter that's uh, being written to this church. And so understanding the teachings of John and the inspiration that God gives John to write the scriptures, we find uh, the conquerors and those who overcome in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This church had not overcame the world because they had not placed their faith or believed in the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. And so, as the church in Philadelphia had been given an open door to the kingdom of God, it was only because they had given an open door to Jesus Christ to lead that church 
and establish that church through his divine guidance and wisdom and will. The church in Laodicea closed the door on Jesus Christ and thus the door to the gates of heaven had been closed on them because they had not believed, they had not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And then uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 28 through 30. I want to ref reference that very briefly. Luke 22, 28 through 30. Jesus says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve trial, tribes of Israel. In this verse 21 here, when it talks about those who have conquered will sit down at the throne of the kingdom of God, they have been promised through their faith in Jesus Christ that they are fellow heirs, that they will be able to experience all of the riches of glory. And so they are have, have been promised that, and Jesus promised that back in Luke chapter 22. And then back in Revelation chapter 3, verse 22, Jesus concludes this letter with the same way he has all other six. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What a change in attitude Jesus has made from Philadelphia to Laodicea. He has found a lukewarm people that have called themselves a church and are not. They have called themselves knowing Jesus Christ, but rather they are only believing in their self-sustaining ways. They are trying to sustain themselves through temporal things, gold and wool and medicine, and nothing that was considered eternal. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, I mentioned Colossae. Colossae was very close to uh, Laodicea. Well, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, when Paul wrote that, he was writing to get rid of a heresy that had developed in this area. And the heresy was uh, who Jesus Christ was, who they believed Jesus Christ to be. And so this is a beautiful, beautiful passage that Paul gives us here in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, because it clearly defines who we ought to believe Jesus Christ is. And if we don't want to become a church like Laodicea was, then we have got to believe what Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says about the living Christ, right. the one and only true Messiah. Paul says this, He, being Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things are created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace by the blood of of his cross. Brothers and sisters, if you believe that about Jesus Christ, then the kingdom of God has been opened to you. If you reject that, if you do not accept that, if you claim to have accepted that and never truly have, the gates of heaven have been closed and are not available. The kingdom of God is not available unto you. That is what we are required to believe about Jesus Christ. Only through the belief in the firstborn of all creation. Only through accepting the one who contained the fullness of God. Only through a saving knowledge of him who has reconciled us to God may we be able to dwell with him in God's <coughs> kingdom. So, the encouragement for today to not become a church in Laodicea is to put away your material things. Put away the ways and the things of this world. Focus your minds, focus your hearts, focus your souls on the kingdom of God. That is the only thing that is going to last for eternity. So many times we get caught up with excuses. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to provide for. Jesus will provide everything that you need in life and he will continue to do so for all of eternity. He will not do it for those that put their trust in the ways of the world. The ways of the world are sinful. They're fallen. They are imperfect. Jesus is imperfect. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. 
No one comes to the Father but by Him. I want to encourage you and warn you with this final passage in Matthew chapter 7 to close this morning. And I encourage you to ponder on this passage, think about this passage, and carry it with you this week, and truly evaluate your current condition, your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you truly have genuine salvation? Have you truly accepted, excuse me, accepted Christ as Savior? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.